Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Expedero with Sherrod Choi. I'm going to talk today about hardware accelerators. Sherrod, accelerators have been gaining traction inside of complex designs for a while, particularly because there's so much data to process. What differentiates an accelerator from some of the other elements that are in a uh, design, particularly a heterogeneous design? So typically in a heterogeneous design, the reason for enabling an accelerator is that other components cannot really satisfy the workload needs. And these needs can be uh, in terms of PPA. You don't have enough performance, you don't have like, uh, you're running out of power budget, or they're too costly, right? Uh, there can also be other application specific needs uh, in terms of uh, latency requirement. Like there are different latency requirements for different uh, objective, like uh, there can be time to first token or inter-token latency for LLMs, for example, right? We have other requirements in terms of precision. So as we try to balance uh, previously mentioned constraints, you might have to deal with performance of the application or accuracy of the application. And this, this precision uh, requires a different way of processing the data. And that can be much more efficient. And so all of these things will actually push an architect to think about, hey, is there any special purpose uh, unit that needs to be part of a heterogeneous SOC or not? Let's take a closer look. Sure. Shirad, what are we looking at? So we're looking at a typical, very simplified block diagram for a heterogeneous SOC. So whenever uh, we started with SOC, right, like we kind of have, like by definition, it's a system on chip. So a system consists of CPU, it consists of interfaces, it consists of memory, like LPDDR interface for like edge devices, it consists of power, like uh, that needs to be plugged in. There can also be different use cases that needs to be like solved. For example, if we have access to camera, then you might need ISP. Or if you need to do some sort of vision processing, you might need to have a GPU on board. Or if you are like having like to support a graphics device, you might need to have a GPU on board, right? There is also uh, optimization that you can do in terms of storing the data on chip rather than uh, sending it to DDR always. And uh, some of the like SOCs might not even have a DDR, like external memory. And so for such applications, we have like on chip memory that can enable them to optimize the data movements from on device to off device. Uh, we also have like uh, since last few years a notion of an NPU which is a neural processing unit and uh, this notion is very much focused towards accelerating neural networks or deep neural networks and especially focusing only on inference. How do these fit in with the other elements when you're designing a chip or a system how do you work this in with the other elements that are there? So uh, neural networks, in a sense, are very special because uh, they are doing a significantly more amount of operation than any of the other blocks that you can see there. Right? Like you can you can think of this in terms of like orders of magnitude. Right? Like when you go from CPU to GPU, you are looking at orders of magnitude more operations. You are doing graphics. You are doing SIMD improvements, like like uh, one dimensional SIMD operations on the graphics processing. Right. Once you go from GPU to NPU, you have another orders of magnitude jump because now we are doing two-dimensional processing. We are doing tensor processing. We have three, four-dimensional tensors that needs to go into like computation, like convolutions or matrix multiplications or any dense operations to be able to produce the final result. So the amount of operation that NPU needs to be supported becomes a key factor on how or what the design needs to look like. But one of the problems here is that the workloads vary fairly significantly, right? So how do you design the NPU to actually take advantage of that? That's actually a very good question. So uh, when we are looking into designing an NPU, we are looking at end-to-end -end workload. We are not looking at a single neural network model. We are basically, the typical workload that our current customer have is a chain of models that needs to run. And these models, uh, if they are running with real-time sensors, will have certain latency requirements. Like we might have to like uh, process every one frame every 30 millisecond for workload, the entire workload, right? There also are user experience level requirement. For example, if you are processing uh, image generation task, uh, the question is, can we generate the image within like one or two seconds so that user can see a responsiveness in terms of applications? And so 
from workload perspective, this comes down to, hey, how fast do we need to actually support the entire set of neural networks, right? Uh, and what is the accuracy requirement that is for such a specific workload that can we, do we have to run everything in FP32, which is going to be near impossible in edge devices, right? But if you are running something which is like less precision, what kind of impact does it have on the final accuracy of like, for example, uh, understanding a text or understanding an image, right? Like and that's, that's basically the trade-off that we need to do. This also has a big effect in terms of lifespan of the components, the utilization, the amount of heat that's generated as well, right? Uh, yes, so uh, NPU by definition need to be very, very optimized for power. Like uh, for us currently, we're looking at like uh, north of 18 tops per watt in seven nanometer. And that's basically becomes uh, like uh, our standard uh, for pushing the power envelope in the edge devices. So uh, 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 let, me, let me give you a typical example, right? Like, uh, so when we are uh, running, let's say uh, ResNet 50, right? We are looking at 25 million, 25 million parameters, but we are looking at 8 billion total operation. And this is only on the small image. As you scale the resolution, we will actually scale the amount of total operation in exactly linear fashion. So as you are processing large resolution images, uh, like let's say HD image, you suddenly have 320 billion ops that need to support per frame. And 320 billion is significant, right? There is, it's like it will take 320 or 320 seconds for CPU to run that, right? But NPU has to run that like multiple times in a second. And so power optimization is extremely important in terms of what we are running and how we are running things. So what happens when you start dealing with chiplets here and you're really dealing with a multi-die system? Uh, so when we are looking into multi-die system, uh, the interface becomes important. The, the great thing about NPO is like the, probably the inputs and outputs are not majority of the bandwidth. So we are not really worried about the system interconnect too much at this level, right? But what becomes important is how this workload can be broken down across the chiplets. Because if you, if you are just processing one NPU in isolation or one chiplet in isolation, it's a problem of managing the chiplet within itself. But as you start process multiple chiplets and as workloads start depending on different, different blocks and there's a pipeline of workload that has to happen, which is typically the case, then the orchestration at the software level, the runtime orchestration becomes an important piece of the puzzle. This changes from one design to the next, right? And one customer to the next. Yes, definitely. So uh, we can take a very simple example, right? Like let's say we are processing uh, as the video frames are coming in into the like and processing them and maybe like uh, doing a super resolution on that, right? And as we are doing that, uh, we basically have to make sure that we are supporting 60 FPS frame rate that is coming in from the sensor, right? And this means that the ISP has to generate the data. But as soon as the ISP generates data, the GNPU cannot wait for entire data to be finished because then that means we will require too much on-chip memory. So basically the ISP memory and NPU need to coordinate in terms of like making sure that the buffer space is minimized. And we need to schedule the entire pipeline of ISP, NPU, ISP, NPU back and forth to be able to give the best possible cost and power ratio to the application. And do you need more than one NPU? Is two, are two NPUs better than one or and four better than two? So that's something we actually discussed in the past uh, where we can actually think about NPUs with different capabilities. Uh, something similar to how we have big little CPUs, we can have big little NPU which is optimized for different workloads and different power profiles. So we don't have to always trigger the uh, like the full blown NPU and we can have like always sensing NPU on. So those capabilities like if, if you have a different domains where uh, you need one NPU, one part of the chip to be actually uh, running at a different speed or different like frequency, then it does make sense to actually have different type of NPUs. Though the cost of it is you're paying as area, right? Like because you're now associating area for two NPUs and if, uh, that there is a slightly more cost in terms of uh, overall chip building. How much customization comes in here with an NPU? Uh, so, uh, we do have a standard set of products, but as we engage with the customers, we understand that like every workload has a different necessities. 
and we actually try to customize our NPUs to be able to fit that workload as best as possible. Like that might be related to shrinking the area or shrinking the cost of the IP or improving the performance, right? And uh, we almost always uh, tailor towards certain workload improvements. Uh, and uh, that might require small amount of customization or sometimes it might actually require like thinking about multiple MPU design and uh, coming up with solution at the system level to effectively solve uh, like higher level problem. If the software changes though, and there's been a, lots of updates that you see in your cell phone every day, does that now uh, run as effectively as it did in the past or do you now have to think about, oh, the next version of this, we're going to need a completely different MPU? Uh, we try to take care of the software updates uh, through an intermediate representations. So as we interact with like new models, these models are actually converted into representation called like we, we call it like expeter IR. It's our internal representation. And that representation underneath is used to compile the model into a binary. So the stack below that representation doesn't necessarily change. We don't really have to change that. But what we have to change is how does the incoming models are actually mapped into that expeter IR. But some of these devices are going to be in the field for years. How do you go about future-proofing them so that it still works and works well enough that everybody says, oh, this is still a good unit? Uh, so AI is rapidly evolving. And for us, future-proofing is a very important aspect of that. Right? So uh, when we design our software and our hardware, we always make sure that we have ability to actually run the new layer that are coming in, right? So we always make sure that we have a way to decompose the operations that have been defined as maybe new layers or new networks, and then have an optimized way of compiling them onto a primitive operation that are supported on NT. And our compiler is already supporting that. We also support a heterogeneous runtime. So what it means is that we are not really just like building a runtime that only constrained ourselves to NPU, but we are trying to schedule and manage the execution of CPU plus NPU plus GPU as needed. And this allows customers to grow, expand, or contract based on their workload in future. So it's part architecture, part abstraction layer. Uh, in a sense, uh, it's a it's a mapping problem, right? Like if you define a layer norm and you need to know what layer norm is considered of, right? Like I'm just taking an example of layer norm as an example, right? So you need to know what it constitutes of. And if you can break down into its primitive like mean and variance, and then use that to actually build up the entire layer norm, then you can always support that on top of the NPU. Sharad Choi, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.